Hi and welcome. I'm Dr. Sean from the WorkWise Institute, and this video is the second in our Be WorkWise, Be TeamWise program, in which we give you the insights you need to become better as team leaders, team members, and teams in general. And in this video, we'll look at Hackman's model. And unlike Tuckman's model, which takes more of a stage based approach to team maturity, Hackman's model is much more of a componential model, meaning it looks at the various enabling factors that are required to make an effective team. And actually, most of the remaining models we'll look at in this series also fall into this category, and they tend to overlap quite a lot as well. So to kick off, it's worthwhile looking at who Richard Hackman is, and then we'll look at what his model says. Richard Hackman, or should I say Professor Richard Hackman, is the Edgar Pierce Professor of Social and Organizational Psychology at Harvard University. He teaches and conducts research on a variety of topics in social and organizational psychology, including team performance, leadership effectiveness, and the design of self-managing teams and organizations. His book, Leading Teams, Setting the Stage for Great Performances, won the Academy of Management's Terry Award for the most outstanding book of the year in 2004, and it's this book that presents the details of the model we'll look at today. So here it is, as mentioned, the model is componential in nature. So the basic principle is that if you're ticking the boxes in each of these areas, there's a strong likelihood that you'll have a high performing team. However, we also need to just get a little bit realistic here and say it's not just about ticking the boxes. Uh, all contexts are different and teams may thrive without ticking some of the boxes and others may not. And of course, different contexts will require different boxes to get ticked in different ways. Nothing is ever as it seems when it comes to teams. Let's then look at the different boxes we need to tick and how we might tick them. As an introductory program, I'll remind you that we will, of course, be skimping out on quite a bit of the detail here, but hopefully you'll get enough of a sense to work with the model in your own context and maybe do a bit more exploring. So let's then look at each element at a very high level. And then in a separate video, I'll look at some further issues for deeper consideration for those of you that are interested in some of the details. Well, first, you'll notice that the diagram is split into two. On the left hand side, we have the core of the model, and that's really the enabling conditions I mentioned earlier. On the right hand side, we have the criteria that we can use to measure team effectiveness. So let's start there. Now, the three criteria a team product acceptable to clients, growth in team capability and group experience, meaningful and satisfying for members, are all things that we can use to assess the effectiveness of a work team, regardless of the task or the setting. There is one caveat though, and the relative weight of these criteria does vary across circumstances. So in some cases, the deliverable to the clients and how they perceive the value of that deliverable may be the most important thing. Whereas other teams and other organizational cultures may emphasize, for example, team growth and see team growth as the means by which we produce the ends. So there's some variation there. We then have the enabling conditions and there's a few of these. So let's go through them one by one. First of all, teams must be real people have to know who is on the team and who is not. And it's the leader's job to make that clear. And as I mentioned in the Tuckman video, we often think we know who's on the team, but very often we don't know who's on the team. And when we go and speak to people about who's on the team and what they're supposed to be doing, there's quite a lot more fuzziness than we would want to see. Second, teams need a compelling direction. Members need to know and agree on what they're supposed to be doing together. And unless a leader clearly articulates a direction, there's a real risk that different members will pursue different agendas. And remember, we said this is increasingly important in the forming stage in the Tuckman's model, where we need to specify exactly what we're supposed to be doing as a team. And that also fits into the team being a real team. Very often the fuzziness and why we're not sure who's on the team and what we're supposed to be doing is because we haven't been given the clear articulation of what the vision, the mission, and the objectives are of the team. Third, teams need enabling structures. Teams that have poorly designed tasks, 
the wrong number or mix of members, or fuzzy and unenforced norms of conduct invariably get into trouble. So what this means then, again, and there's a few aspects to consider here, for example, how do we define and design tasks? How do we give instructions? Do people know what is expected of them? And then are they held accountable when they don't behave or act in certain ways? And now it's very easy often to measure the output of people, but often in team dynamics, we don't look at the behaviors by which people are operating. And very often it's actually the behaviors and the habits of people that can get in the way of effective teams. So we need to be a bit more specific and very often when we get pulled into team dysfunctions, our core job is really to fix the behavior of team members and very often that requires a team charter so that people know what is expected of them from a behavioral perspective amongst other perspectives and then an enforcement of that team charter so often the team leader but also team members need to hold people to account and that's quite difficult to do and so it doesn't often happen when we look at patrick lencioni's framework we'll see how also that accountability relies on things like trust and other aspects of the team to be in place. Fourth, teams need a supportive organization. And I quite like the way Hackman describes teams as potential seedlings, which makes the organizational context the soil in which they are planted. And the question then is, how fertile is that soil? And we could look broadly at the organizational context by looking at things like culture and the leadership and those types of issues but we can also hone into some of the specific systems that are in place within the organization so first we could look at the reward system and basically the reward system should provide recognition and reinforcement contingent on excellent team performance very often our reward and recognition structures focus on individual performance and so the team gets left behind the second system we can then look at is human resources or human capital. And in particular, we can think about training and development. And in our experience, particularly in bigger organizations, these tend to focus on the more technical or hard skills required to get the job done. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. It's an obvious requirement from a strategic and operational perspective. The challenge is because of that emphasis, we tend to neglect the softer skills training, the transferable skills and the team management type things. And this is in particular for new supervisors and new team leaders that are probably good at their jobs and they get put into a management position, but they have absolutely no idea how to manage people. And that's actually what their job is. And so we need to think about how we structure our training and development programs to include a team emphasis in addition to the more technical individual skills requirements that are needed. And the last system, and by the way, I don't mean the last system that we should consider, it's just the last example we'll cover here, is the information system. And that basically is what information is available at what levels, and then do teams have access to the data they need to fulfill their objectives? So what form of information are we giving our teams and can they relate to it and use it? And again, this seems pretty straightforward, but we often see that, for example, teams don't have access to monthly data, weekly data and daily data about their performance. They don't have access to information about where their products and services or the tasks they're fulfilling fill into a bigger picture, particularly a strategic one. And in simple instances, we've had clients come to us saying there's team dysfunction, but the team doesn't have information to things like customer information and feedback, and yet they're supposed to design and develop products and services. And one kind of can't figure out why people would get this so wrong, but we also know that things like information is power. And so some things are kept secret for various reasons and different agendas. So it's not clear cut and it's not simple just to say we must give teams the information they need because we can also over provide information or dump too much information and then people start drowning and trying to figure out what they're supposed to be doing with all this information. So this is by no means an easy topic or easy solution, but we have to be mindful of it. The fifth and then final enabling condition is expert coaching. And 
this is actually interesting and Hackman takes a bit of a different tack here because most models don't even include coaching and so I think it's quite an important addition that he makes and then he also goes further because we know that most executive coaches actually focus on individual performance and individual abilities and, and that's right because that's why we often do executive coaching but this doesn't significantly improve teamwork and he's done a lot of research in this area to show why that's the case largely teams need coaching as a group in team processes so they need to know how to do things together and I'm not a fan of team building the way it's usually done. You know, going and playing war games or a game of football or cooking a meal together, that doesn't really help. We need to know what processes are a problem and then we need to set up initiatives to fix those problems. But we have to do them as a group. And then the other thing is when should we do coaching? And here the rule is quite simple, as much as possible, but certainly at the start, where you start to see problems in terms of Tuckman's model, we know that storming starts quite early on. We need coaching there. There's often midpoints to judge how things are going that we need to look at. And then at the end of a team project as well, and that's the debrief that we spoke about in Tuckman's model as well, when the team adjourns. And these all feed into other things like information systems. So if we've had team success, what are some of those recipes? And more importantly, if teams have failed, what are the recipes there? Because we learn more from failure than we do from success, except we don't share that information because we don't like to tell people about failures. And there we have it. That's Hackman's model in a nutshell. So I hope that was useful for you. And there's some pointers that you can take back to your own teams, whether you're a team leader or a team member. Please also remember to check out our website. We've got a whole bunch of assessments there as well. If you want to check into your team effectiveness and whether you need team building and all those types of things, you can go to our assessments page, which is available at assessments.workwise.org.za. So if it was useful, please like and subscribe. Otherwise, I will see you hopefully in the next video where we'll tackle some more models around team effectiveness. So I hope to see you there and thanks for joining. Thank mm -hmm. you.